to be in a city like that, which is very proud of its heavy industry and you know all the things that are made out of steel. And it was and they they were just going, you know, the only thing to do is to go and watch a wrecking ball knock down the factory that your three generations of your family had worked in. And that you know they just do that and then go to the pub because there's nothing else to do. And it was really it was really moving. I thought. Mm. So it's interesting that, that the stories that you seem to be drawn to tell have <coughs> are, are sort of quite dark at their heart, but you tell them through a lens of you know humour and lightness that somehow makes it joyful. Well, I suppose that's a no it's not fair to say it's a northern thing, but it's particularly northern that sense of uh, the worse things get, the better the jokes get. It's a you know laughter is a coping mechanism, isn't it? Mm. It's, it's your your you're laughing. If you can laugh in the face of these things, you're, it's a way of dealing with trauma and sadness. Uh, uh, and I love that. I mm -hmm. think it's brave. Mm -hmm. You know. And so again, looking back at the full Monty, is that something? How, how do you see that through the sort of lens of hindsight? Well, that was another film that nobody really wants to make either. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we had to get the money from America <laughs> for a film about Sheffield and about the sort of British working class and, uh, mm. and, and Thatcherism. Uh, and again, it was, it, was, it was such a delight to me mm. that it took off. But it was really the first film, was well, certainly the first film I'd made. It was the second script I'd written. So I kind of assumed that every film I wrote was going to do that. <laughs> you know, why not? <laughs> Seems to be. So I had 10 years of searing disappointment after that. Oh. Uh, when that didn't happen, until I realised that it was really unusual what happened. Because again, it's not, it wasn't a sort of film that Americans would usually take to their heart. They tried to subtitle it to begin with in the States, because everyone just said, we don't understand what they're saying. <laughs> and they, it looks funny, but I don't know, is it? Um, so, again, I don't know, it, was, if, it feels like a small film with a grand grander themes, uh, going from the very particular to the universal, which is something yeah, I really like. Yeah, there is a universality about it, isn't there? Yeah. And, and so, I'm interested in the, in the creative process as well, because I think so, it feels to me like so much of it is about slogging away in a room by yourself, uh, you know, coming up with stuff. Is that what it's actually like? Or, you know, how much of it is about sort of, you know, in, individual pursuit of creative excellence, and how much is it about sort of teamwork and collaboration? It's hugely teamwork motivated. I don't think writers are very good at that by their nature, actually. How does it feel to sort of hand your horrible, baby yeah. to somebody else? I try and avoid doing it. Even now, okay. I find it a very nerve-wracking process to mm -hmm. spend three, four months on something and then just give it to somebody mm -hmm. who may be reading it on the tube on a Friday night. Or have a well, slightly I, different interpretation of who those people well, are. Well, everyone always does. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's where the teamwork is, is, is corralling everybody into a single vision. It's really difficult. Mm -hmm. And that means that I have to shift my position and they have to shift their position. Mm -hmm. We have to find something that we all understand is a central drive of this film without it becoming this sort of muddy yeah. combination of everyone's ideas and thoughts. Because they're, and have you got they're not stupid people in the film, they're all clever. But the problem with clever people is they have clever opinions that might not coincide with your clever opinion. Mm -hmm. And when you get three of those in a room, you've got to really negotiate. And have you got better at um, managing that over time? Because yeah. you know, and knowing when to just say, do you know what, it's got to be this way and I'm really firm about that, or this area is... Yeah, I used, I used to be really scared of shifting my position. I, as I've got older, I've realised that, that a screenplay is really pliable, it's really plastic, you can mm -hmm. squeeze it and stretch it and push it that way and take this bit out and put it over there. And, mm -hmm. Uh, and that just comes with sort of greater sort of uh, craft skills, I suppose. But I used to be really frightened that if anyone changed everything, it would ruin it. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would get fired or fire myself, um, which I've done on quite a few films in my early career. And I look back and I go, oh, I could have done that. I could have switched that around. Instead of which, I go, no, you have to do it that way or it's not happening. And oddly, they just fired me and got another right. <laughs> it's very brutal like that. I thought people would see my point of view. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a famous person in our industry, in the advertising industry, called Sir John Hegarty, who once said, uh, you know, brilliant creativity is 80% idea 
and 80% execution, which I think is a brilliant way of sort of you know, talk, uh, talking about the sort of almost disproportionate importance of each of those different elements, and neither one of them can, can ruin it. So I, I don't know if you found that as well. Yes, I think, well at every stage. It's a, it's a strange, moving, creative beast. It starts off with an idea that becomes a screenplay, which is different, and then you give it to a producer or a director, and they have a slightly different take on it. You start filming on a set and the actors do things, you think, oh, it's changed again. Mm -hmm. In an edit suite, you're cutting material and it always changes. Sometimes even the theme has changed. And then you put a, give it to a musician, and suddenly, the, the, the mood of an entire film or an entire scene can change, just depending on the music. Uh, and then you give it to publicity, and they say the feel-good movie of the year, and you go, wow, what, the one where they scoop children's eyes out. <laughs> wow. Uh, and so at each stage of the process, it's, it's shifting and changing, and, and, and you have to be alive and accepting of, of being part of 150 people, all of whom at certain points will come in with their expertise and go this way, that way, this way. And try and, you know, ride the tiger all the way to the end and still have a good film. That's why there aren't very many good films. Really? Because it's really hard to make a really good film. They can get knocked off course so easily at one point in the process. Um, should we just talk a little bit about leadership? Because, yeah. um, you know, this is the, you uh, were awarded the School Leadership Award. Um, ha has your idea of leadership changed over time? You know, do you, did you see yourself as a leader when you, when you got the award? How do you think your leadership has manifested itself? Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I, I felt absolutely entitled to my leadership award <laughs> when I was 16. Um, and now I wouldn't accept my leadership award. Um, uh, I think it was you or John said, do you want a title for this? And I, I, I didn't come up with a title, but I thought, just thought today, it would be, a, well, I suppose somebody has to be in charge, <laughs> would be the title, because I'm very ambivalent about leadership. Um, and I used, to, I used to think, when I got the award, it was about being really good at things, being the best at it. Mm. Being like the head boy, or the captain of rugby, or... Uh, and as I've grown older, I've looked at leaders and thought, oh yeah, they have, they're kind of damaged people. And it's really interesting how the kind of, how your childhood and your upbringing will create an asymmetry in your intellect, your psyche, your emotions, that will push you in a really interesting way. Uh, and leadership is often, I think, a, a, a demand to be heard. And if you take a step back and go, why, why do you need to be heard? And it can be really dangerous, I think. You know, you look at some of our leaders now and you go, wow, that's leadership. Mm. Supposedly. Well, they are, they are leading. Mm. And you have, you know, if you, look, if you look at Putin, who's the, the youngest child of three children, the elder two died, you, you know, you don't have to be Freud to go, huh, that's, that's where the baby of the family it's grew up. Step this is incredible, well, like, incredibly spoiled, incredibly responsible for the rest of his family and doting parents and it's it's very interesting you look at Boris Johnson you look at his background you go this is a man who's desperate desperate to be loved and you think that has he's morphed into a certain sort of leader because of that and that and so my view of leadership is very ambivalent and I I have to be in charge of a hundred people on the film set and I do it in a very different way than I used to think leadership was or how you behave as a leader and I try and do it in a very collegiate way and I try and do it quietly I try and do it with empathy uh, and it mostly works uh, but you that sort of soft leadership you were at the mercy of uh, of strong personalities and kind of alpha males and I was never that alpha male I thought I was one of those that's why I thought I'd go into the army so you tried that to be that alpha, alpha Yeah, I did, and I was really good at pretending. Mm -hmm. And I was really, you know, I was really good at rugby, and I ran really fast, and I, I made a lot of noise in class, and I, I, I kind of, I kind of conned the Rank Foundation into giving me a leadership <laughs> award. Not a um, 
and I wasn't really happy being that person at all. And I, and I got really unhappy at university because I was trying to be somebody I wasn't. You know? And I gradually worked my way back to being in charge of people, if you want to put it like that. But in a way that I'm comfortable with. Um, oh, hooray! A question! Brilliant. How would you... Speak up so everyone can hear. How would you describe your style of leadership from when you first started managing a production team compared to how you manage now? Uh, I listen, is what happened. That's number one. I, I, I volunteered for the Samaritans for a long time, which was a really good um, uh, educating and listening. Mm. Active listening. Kind of yes, that's right. They call it active listening. Yeah. Uh, and it's really interesting. You can hear someone listen. You can hear. You can hear them paying attention. Don't ask me how. Even down a phone. Mm. If you start nodding off at two in the morning, which I often have done to my shame, um, the person at the other end of the line somehow knows you're not listening. Um, so that, that would be, that's the word that instinctively comes to mind. Rather than commanding, I listen and then try and figure out what people need. Because as I say, uh, lots, of, lots of collegiate enterprises which come from people being very good and very talented at their jobs, they are people with needs uh, that need meeting in one way or another. And often they, it's really easy for those sort of people to clash because because uh, the needs need to be met quite powerfully um, so it's that negotiation which I find really interesting and I used to do it as a screenwriter still occasionally rewrite uh, scenes of a film that's a sort of big Hollywood blockbuster that they have to reshoot some scenes or they're two weeks away from shooting and they've got a script that doesn't work mm -hmm. and ha how that ever happens I don't know but it often does um, and I, and I come in at that point and listen to lots of warring people who are in a panic, they're about to be fired. They've got people in Pinewood Studio, the sets are built. They've got actors who won't say the lines because they hate them. They've got a director who's really grumpy and scared of the actors. They've got people in LA who wake up at five o'clock, uh, five o'clock UK time and ring in with different demands from what you've been doing all day. And I absolutely love trying to negotiate a route through all these big egos who needed to be heard. And I found it, a re I, I, it's really enjoyable. Wow. To Most people, many people would find that incredibly stressful. If, if I had to do that for the whole shoot and was responsible for it, hmm. it would be incredibly stressful. To come in to fix it is really nice. Okay. Because you can <laughs> I can then two weeks later walk away. <laughs> Having fixed it, hopefully. But, Very good. Um, uh, Elaine, thank you for starting the questions. Yeah, uh, please. Let's, so I'm, let's I'm, I'm open it up to the floor. Simon, you've just got one about um, the full multi and um, Slumdog. Do you, do you notice a change in the industry having, uh, having those films been commissioned and been successful? Or not what really. Was? Not really. The big change has been the advent of streaming. That's huge. There were little bumps. There was a sort of full Monty bump, there was a Slumdog bump, there was a King's Speech bump, you know. Films that really break out and go big, there's a little sort of flurry of excitement. But it doesn't really change the overall power structure of big studio movies get made and little British films tend not to get made. So why has streaming made the difference? Is it um, more money, more variety, it's just more huge commission? Huge amounts of content needed. Okay. Huge amounts of films. They can't get enough. So there's room everybody in the industry, in the film industry, is employed now. It's unheard of. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally everybody who wants a job and has a skill is employed. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. But it's never been like that in my life. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Do you think it's democratised the, the, the industry more? Is it more de democratic or is it still very ne nepotism? It's not. No, I don't think it's nepotistic. I think it is. It's really helping. A lot of the, um, a lot of the streamers are very keen. Uh, on <coughs> gender equality, on bringing people up from working class roots. They're just, they're just starting that. That's the last taboo, really. They're very inclusive. They want to be very diverse in who they employ, and they want to bring people up and bring them through an industry, which you now can do, because you can have a career. It's not just one film, and then you struggle for the next five years to get your next film. 
It's a job, you know. People going job to job to job. Um, and, and the streamers in particular are very strong bringing all those bits of Britain that have been completely ignored from a, from a very privileged, really what was a very privileged industry. Uh, it's less so. Great, Zara. Do you ever, this is a bit of a leading question, apologies. Oh, um, good. Do you ever find yourself wanting to micromanage the other components, for example, like the sound tracking, the casting? Oh, everything, order, yeah. And, and have you had temper that within yourself? Yeah, have I just have, I, I to, have to uh, handcuff myself to a desk. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's such a... We're, we're casting a television show with the characters from the Full Monty at the moment, which we're shooting in three weeks' time. Um, with the same With actors. the same actors and their children and their grandchildren. It's a huge, great cast. And I, I want to be all over everything, all the casting and everything. And I just have to allow a director to do some of that. Um, because it's really hard to know where to stop. You know, if you've written something, you have people in your head, so you want to cast it. When they're cast, you want to be in on the rehearsals. And, and then you want to know what angle they're shooting from. And it, it's, it, that's the director's job, is to be a complete control freak, really. But I have those tendencies, <coughs> but I have to rein them in. Um, I'm, not, I'm not doing it. Now you mention it, I'm not doing it very well. Then. <laughs> so thank you. Sorry, Natasha, speak up. Have you ever written a screenplay? <coughs> yeah, it doesn't really work that I have, but it's really heartbreaking. Just I wrote a part especially for one actor. Um, Go on, tell us who it is. Go on. Oh, I can't. It would be really unfair. Uh, actually, no, it wouldn't be unfair because the, she couldn't do it because she was doing another TV series. It's a woman called Siobhan Finneran, who I've always wanted to work with all my life, and I wrote this part especially for her, and she couldn't do it. Uh, and that's happened a few times in my life, and so I try not to do that because um, it generally doesn't work. <clears throat> Although I suppose with the Full Monty uh, next generation, you've got the luxury of well, knowing I, who's going I to. I knew exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I guess the TV series is written precisely for those six actors. Um, yeah, but that's very particular. Yeah. Thing. Got to be quite a luxury. Um, any more questions from the audience, Mark? Yeah. I mean, you mentioned about the global nature of film industry. Do you see yourself as a British filmmaker, or is there even a British film industry anymore? Is it more an international thing? It's a really interesting question. I'm not sure. I sort of do see myself as a British filmmaker. I really like talking about Britain, but of course, Slumdog Millionaire was not about Britain. <laughs> um, I think. It's interesting when you see something like sex education, which is British, but it... It's British. Yes, it? Yeah. It, ha it, it has kind of those American high school locker corridors. And yeah. It, it felt really um, transgressive, and I was really terrified that we were being taken over, even in the design department, mm -hmm. by a kind of Americanization of, of Britain. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't really think that's true. I just think... I think there'll always be a very particular British take on life and a particular British tone which doesn't really exist anywhere else. And it's really hard to pin down. Um, but the, the Full Monty is not an American film, and nor could it be a French film. It is very peculiarly British. Uh, and I, I find it hard to put my finger on it. But there, there, there has always been something called the British film industry that limps along, and it will continue to somehow limp along, even with this huge superstructure that is mostly American financed. Okay, Jane. Question about inspiration because obviously the um, the two the two the two biggest things that you discussed tonight, and um, that you've been working in terms of inspiration. So I work in, in creative industry as well. I'm constantly notebook or taking photographs and I really try to make time for that as I've sort of gone up the ranks by now I'm probably really inclined to it. don't buy massive creativity but I try and keep keep that side of me alive. How do you do that now that you're you know you've got big film studios and people do you spend an hour a day walking in the woods or <laughs> No it's quite it's really good a, a question. I I go running a lot um, which clears my mind out, and I've, I've done a lot of karate, 
weird. And old man doing karate got another foot injury from doing karate. Um, which everybody who knows me says, you're too old to do that. But actually it's really good for clearing my head of everything else. You can't possibly think of the troubles of the day when someone might be punching <laughs> you in the face. So that's what, that is where I find the clarity where you will then have a little bit of space creative. Great. Um, shall we just, um, uh, I think we'd love to just keep on going for hours and hours. Yes, but, sure. uh, uh, we'll probably finish off. I, I wonder if you just reflecting on uh, getting the School Leadership Award, what difference do you think it's made to your life in, in hindsight? It uh, completely changed my life. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here. I don't know where I would be. No, nobody could possibly say where the forks would take you otherwise. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't have gone down a creative route. I don't think. I was sort of hiding that bit of myself. Um, and it just it opened that whole area of theatre and writing and I ended, ended up doing a sculpture and ceramics degree which everyone thought was hilarious and stupid. But actually I nearly became a potter. So, so my, my journey through life nearly went in a completely different but a very creative direction. Um, so, you know, I, I owe a huge amount to the Rank Foundation um, and would do pretty much anything. Uh, to thank. And finally, any 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 bits of advice? There's, there's several young people in the <laughs> in the audience who are just starting out on their journey. So, you know, any any pearls of wisdom that uh, they can benefit from your experience or? I don't. Everyone's everyone's path through life is so individual. I don't. I think if you're determined to do something, really, really, I think don't be put off doing it. Because even if it doesn't work, you won't lie on your deathbed and go, I should have done that. Mm. If you give it 10 years and it hasn't worked, well, you gave it 10 years and you'd have learned a lot. Um, I've been trying, there's a film I've got that's been sitting in my drawer for 10 years and I've been trying to make it. And I won't ever stop trying to make it. And it probably isn't even any good. There's probably a reason why no one wants to make it. But I won't ever go to my deathbed and think, damn, I should have, I should have pushed that more. Um, but no, I don't have any principles at all. Yeah, well, I, I think that's a pretty good point to end on. So pursue your dreams. Uh, please join me in a huge thank you. No,